I'm very happy to be here. I have a lot of things I'd like to say. Um, I'm going to tell you some stories. And they're not to entertain you. I hope you will enjoy them. But they're really to explain points that you mightn't otherwise understand as well. Uh, but there are many wonderful stories to describe what is going on in the world today. We are in a crisis situation in Canada and throughout the world. We have never been in such a, a situation as we are in now. The difficulties, terrible, terrible things that are happening in Iran. How the, the numbers of the, the believers are being martyred. They are being having their houses burned down. They are being treated so badly. Their money is taken away from them. They are losing their jobs. And in every way, they are having an extremely difficult time there. And in other places in the world, we seem to be having a difficulty uh, teaching. And uh, uh, But in other, there are other places where the work is going very well. And so we want to talk about some of these and to give you a picture and to realize, I hope to be able to, to show how uh, the faith of Baha'u'llah is the one and the only hope for mankind. As the Universal House of Justice said to us not long ago, uh, upon your efforts depends in very large measure the fate of humanity. We are now in the position, friends, where we need more Baha'is and more money uh, to carry on the work. And uh, I'm going to tell you how we overcome these things. And mainly it is the fact that we know that God does assist all those who arise to serve him. We, we must realize that, that God does assist. He has promised us. And so I may, I will tell you a few stories to illustrate how very important it is that we continually realize how we must turn to God and ask for his help and to, uh, count on that assistance. Audrey and I, uh, Audrey being my wife, who wasn't able to be here today, uh, we, with two of our children, uh, Nina, who was then age 13, and Patrick, 19, uh, we uh, cabled the guardian said that we would like to pioneer wherever he would like us to go. And that was in 1953. And he cabled back Betuan land, highly meritorious. So we were on the first ship out of uh, St. John, New Brunswick, for uh, Cape Town. And we had our car, and from there we drove up into Betuan land and to Mafeking, which was the capital. And uh, we had 13 years in Betuan land, and we loved them. We had no thought of ever coming back to Canada. Uh, that doesn't mean that we aren't very happy to be in Canada, but we loved the, the, the people there and the work, and, and it was going so well, and we were so pleased with it. Uh, soon after we arrived, we were given positive instructions that we were to, to teach the black people, not the whites. 
And this was a, a bit of a problem because I had to earn my living and uh, the way I had been earning it for many years before leaving Canada uh, was I was in the life insurance business. And uh, I found when I arrived at my post in Mafeking that uh, I could only sell to the white people because at that time the black people were not able to buy life insurance. So um, we had the, the uh, situation where we taught the faith to the black people and we made our money selling life insurance to the white people. And we couldn't let the white people know that we were spending all our evenings with the black people. Because in those days, uh, the black and the white people didn't meet socially. They, they just didn't meet, period. And they still don't do very much of that either, but there, there has been some, some improvement in that situation in those years. But I want to tell you what happened to us. Um, we, um, we learned, uh, we realized even, of course, before we went, that God does assist all those who arise to serve him. That a band of chosen angels will accompany anyone going forth to serve the faith. We were told this, and we knew it was true. And we had proven it uh, many times before we had gone there. But the... Uh, the situation we found ourselves in there was um, having to earn a living by teaching, uh, by, uh, by selling insurance to the white people, and yet doing our Baha'i work by teaching the faith to the black people. And so we thought when we first arrived, the important thing was for us to establish a business in the, in the insurance business uh, before we bothered with the, uh, the Baha'i work. So we got to know some white people, and I started right in business. And uh, the white people were very nice to us, and we had lovely neighbors, and oh, we made many friends among the white people. They were delightful people, and they were always having parties, and we were invited to them, and we felt it a good thing to go because we get to know them, and then they would, they would just have to buy some life insurance. So in that way, we we were able to to uh, make a little money. But after we'd been there about um, three months, we had a lovely message, a cable from our beloved guardian, congratulating us on having settled in our goal and saying that now was the time that we should begin to teach the black people. Well, that was a bit of a shock to us because we weren't teaching the black people. We didn't know any. Um, we, had, uh, we had bought a house and we had two servants. Everybody had lots of servants down there. But they didn't speak any English. So we couldn't teach them the faith. And uh, so we wondered, and now that the guardian wanted us to start to teach the black people right away, we didn't know how to go about it. We saw many black people on the street, but... Uh, uh, we couldn't very well say, well, come on in. We want to talk to you about God. And uh, so we had a few problems like this. But this uh, cable from the Guardian came on the day of a feast. And Audrey and I had the feast alone. And that was a bit of a joy, too. Because our house in Canada, here in Toronto, or Forest Hill, was just filled with people all the time. And here in, in Africa, we didn't have anybody. We 
we've had lots of spare time to ourselves. But when suddenly we were faced with the need to find somebody to teach who was black and we didn't know anybody, and you will admit that that was a bit of a problem. So we had our feast. We read the cable and we reread it. And we wondered, how are we going to connect with black people? It just didn't seem possible. And so we thought about it and we prayed about it. And finally, Audrey said that uh, one of our white friends had told her that there was a black doctor in the town, a doctor by the name of Dr. Madiri Mulema. And, uh, but we didn't know where his office was or where we could find him. Uh, we, uh, Audrey also said that this person had told her that Dr. Malema was a perfectly wonderful person, that not only was he an outstanding surgeon, but that he, he was a writer. He had written uh, three books, on the life of his own Bichwana people. He was a musician, and he had organized a choir of 18 voices, and they had been singing um, in Mafeking and in other places. And he was a, a, a very fine person in, in every way. So we thought, well, there is the man who would be make our wonderful Baha'i, if only we could get in touch with him. But we didn't know him, we didn't know where to find him. But after much consultation, we decided that he was the man. But then how were we going to to get to see him? So we decided that, uh, this was a Saturday night, we decided that on Monday I should go to see him after lunch and try to talk to him about life insurance and pray that he wouldn't want any because I, I couldn't sell him any. And uh, that seemed a bit of a problem, but we, we, we couldn't think of any other way to handle this situation. So uh, on Monday, I came home for lunch all prepared to go out to call on Dr. Malema. I had found where his office was, and uh, Audrey greeted me with the news that Lena, she was the the, uh, the gal we had in our, in our house, she was black, had stepped on a nail and had a very sore foot. And Audrey had been bathing this foot and doing everything she could to give Lena some relief from this pain. And we, we realized that we had to get a doctor in to see Lena. And we thought, and we knew that the chosen angels would handle this situation for us. <clears throat> we didn't have any doubt about the, the chosen angels. We knew that they would, they would find somebody, some way of ha getting us to some black person someplace. So, uh, we then thought instead of going to talk life insurance to Madiri Malema, um, we would uh, get him to come in to see Lena. <clears throat> the only difficulty to that was that right next door to us, we had a black doctor. No, no, we had a white doctor. And he and his wife had been very kind to us. And they were always sending us cakes and Oh, all kinds of things and coming to see us and they had become friends of ours and we thought well we can't bring a black doctor in to treat our maid when we have this very nice white doctor right next door he'd be sure to see him and the, do the black one would probably come and park his car right outside this other doctor's house and it just seemed to be filled with problems. But again, we thought, well, the Baha'u'llah will handle that one nicely. So uh, we waited on that day until it was dark. 
about <laughs> about eight o'clock, Audrey continued to bathe Lena's foot. And finally, about eight o'clock, I phoned the doctor and uh, introduced myself and asked him, told him about Lena's foot and asked if he would come. Well, he told us later that he was scared to death. He'd, he'd never heard my voice before. And here somebody was coming, uh, and he had been accused of having communist tendencies before that. And he thought, well, here somebody was out to get him again. And he said he was sorry he couldn't come in to my house that night to treat Lena's foot because his car wasn't working. It had broken down. And I said, well, Dr. Malema, I will come out to get you if you will come. Oh, he said, you'd never find my house. I, I live away out of town, miles out of town, and you'd never find it. Well, I knew that the, the chosen angels would get me there if I had his consent. And I said, don't worry about that, Dr. Malema. I'll get there if you'll, if you'll come. So he, he was in the position where he had nothing else but to say, well, okay. So I got out there. And uh, it was nothing but the chosen angels. I don't know how many it took. But <laughs> we got, I got out there anyway and uh, to his house. And he, he did live way out to, off the main street, miles off. And I found this most delightful person, a man of about 65, and uh, black as, as the ace of spades, but a great broad smile and just the kind of person you couldn't help falling in love with. And so he got in my car, we drove to my house, <laughs> and we took him around and, and uh, to Lena. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in that part of the world, the, the servants, your black servants, don't sleep in your house. They aren't allowed to, but they all have a little house of their own outside. It's called a kaya. And so Lena had a kaya, and we took the, the doctor out there, and he looked at his at her, her uh, foot and treated it and said that she'd be all right in a day or two. So then we were going, leaving the kaya, and then uh, uh, we were, Audrey and I were kind of hoping we would get him inside our front door some way. And it happened that I had a, a sore finger. <laughs> I'd had a, a, a hangnail, and I'd pulled the hangnail. And, you know, do you ever do that? And that, um, that kind of gave me an infected finger. And so I, I said, would you come in and look at this finger? It's pretty sore. And um, so he came in, and uh, he looked at it, and he, well, he said, yes, that does look pretty sore. And he whipped some black jug out of his satchel and wrapped my finger up, and, and uh, uh, he said, you better come to my office tomorrow, to my surgery, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll have a good look at it there. Well, that pleased us because we wanted more appointments and so then Audrey and I drove him back, and by the time we got him back to his house, we were just in love with this this man. He was a, oh, he's a wonderful person. And uh, so then I had a, 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 an appointment to go to his office the next morning, and he was going to take a real look at the finger. So the next morning I went, and... Uh, he was working on my finger and, and standing behind me. And he said, Mr. Robarts, do you believe in prayer? And I thought, boy, that's a good subject. <laughs> I'm right, right in here. And I said, yes, I do. And, uh, well, he said, I do too. He said, you know, uh, I'm a doctor, but I don't ever heal anybody. He said, God heals. I do what I can uh, to help with the process, but it's God always who heals. And he said, do you believe that? I said, oh, yes, of course I believe that. And as I was sitting in his chair over on the wall, 
there was a picture of the graduates of Edinburgh University. And I said to him, are you, a, are you a, an Edinburgh grad? He said, yes, I am. And he said, I have a brother who went to Glasgow. And he's a, he's a, a graduate of Glasgow. I am Edinburgh. And I said, well, that's, that's interesting. I said, your father <clears throat> must have been a very progressive man. And well, he said, my father was a progressive man. Um, but uh, he said, you, uh, do you ask me that? Because he was able to send his two sons overseas for an education. I, I said, yes. Well, he said, you know, my father was a very progressive man. But he said, my grandfather, he was really a progressive man. He said, do you know that... <clears throat> Um, um, my grandfather was the first convert to Christianity in the whole of this country of Betuana land. And I thought, boy, this is the right family. I... <laughs> Imagine that. And uh, so uh, uh, he said, well, now that finger of yours, I may need to to do a little more with it, um, and this this was uh, uh, what day it was? I think this was Wednesday. And he told me to come back on the Friday, and that was good news for us because that meant another chance to to get at him. And uh, Audrey, in the meantime, was at home praying for all she was worth. And between us and the chosen angels, we thought, well, things are going pretty well. And uh, so on Friday morning, Mrs. Malema telephoned. And she said, uh, you were to see my husband this afternoon. I said, yes. Well, she said, would you mind coming on Monday instead? She says, you know, he's at home with a cold. And it's the first time he's had a day off in 25 years. And if you could come Wednesday instead, that that would be just fine. Well, I said, Mrs. Malema, I could do that. But uh, I had quite a sore finger. It really wasn't quite that sore. But um, would he let me come out to see him at the house? And I boasted that I knew where, his, where their house was. And uh, so she consulted him and came back and said, fine. Uh, you come this afternoon. So I went out this, in the afternoon and I had a basket of fruit and I had a book uh, which you all know and that's uh, Eslamont's Baha'u'llah in the New Era. So I got out there and he he, he fixed my finger and um, uh, then I said to him, I said, Dr. Malema, do you remember when I was in your office the other day, we talked about prayer. I said, I have a book here, and there's one chapter on prayer, which I think you would enjoy. Will you read it? Well, yes, he said, I'd be glad to read it. Fine. And, uh, and so he said, you come to my office. I'll be better by, by uh, Monday. And uh, then he said, I'll give you back your book. So on Monday, I arrived in, and his office was filled with people. And he saw me coming, and he came right out to the door and greeted me and took me right in through all the, the crowd of black people. Took me back to his, his uh, surgery. And he said, Mr. Abars, that book you gave me the other day, he said, you asked me to read that chapter of prayer. I said, yeah. Well, he said, I've read the whole book. And he said, I've read that chapter on prayer three times. And he said, I, wanted, I want you to tell me one thing. Uh, he said, since you've been in this country, have you brought any people into the faith here in this country? I said, no, no, I, we haven't done anything like that. Well, then he said, do you mean to tell me that if I were to become a Baha'i, <laughs> would I be the first Baha'i in, in, in Betuana land? I said, yes, you would be. Well, he said, you know, my grandfather was the first Christian, and that means that I'd be the first Baha'i. 
And I said, that's right. And he threw his arms around my neck, and he was a Baha'i from that moment on. <laughs> now, I ask you, do you believe that, that the chosen angels work? And that's pretty fast work. And uh, from then on, uh, Madiri became our closest and our dearest friend. He did everything. He taught his, within a week, his sister was a Baha'i, and, <laughs> and his sister's um, husband was a Baha'i, and he had introduced us to all kinds of other people. And uh, he said, uh, he said, we'll have firesides in my house every Wednesday fireside in our house. So that, that suited us very well. And he would have people, the chiefs would come in from the, uh, from the Betuan land, and uh, we would meet them. And he would talk about the faith. And uh, we happened to take a lot of books with us, Baha'i books. Almost every book they had in the, in the, uh, in the library. And uh, I took a whole trunk full of books, and he uh, he borrowed them all and read them, and he was by far the best read man of the lot, and uh, he was he was reading all the time. He couldn't get enough of these Baha'i books, and he understood them, and uh, and then he was teaching and introducing us to other people, and uh, uh, so that's that's one way that the chosen angels work. They, they, and don't you think that that is a pretty good effort on the part of those chosen angels? They, uh, uh, if, if we analyze that story and see how many totally impossible things happen, imagine Lena stepping on a nail that day, the day that I happened to have a sore finger. And uh, uh, he knew all these people. And he, uh, he was forever uh, introducing us to people. And uh, Well, then I must tell you, these firesides that we had on Wednesdays at his house were delightful. And his wife, her, na his, her name was Lucretia. And uh, Lucretia was interested... Um, in the faith, but she didn't want to become a Baha'i. In fact, she was uh, active in the church that Madiri's grandfather had established when he was alive. And so we didn't push her, although we occasionally suggested that she become a Baha'i, but she didn't. But she provided us with the best coffee you ever drank, and uh, took part in the whole thing and, and was very happy about it. But we uh, the sad thing about all this is that uh, Madiri died a few years later. And I might say that one time I had a letter from him from Haifa. He and Lucretia and their daughter uh, decided they would like to go and see what the shrine looked like. And they didn't know they had to have permission to make a pilgrimage. They, uh, Audrey and I were out of town, and he just up and headed for Haifa. <laughs> and he got there, and uh, he wrote a beautiful letter about what a wonderful place it was, and how happy he was to be a Baha'i, and so on. And, uh, and then uh, he continued until he died, about five years after that. And it was a great loss to us to have him go that way. But uh, uh, she continued uh, to be interested and to have firesides in the house occasionally. And in the meantime, other people they had... Uh, well, I think that will perhaps give you that story pretty well. Uh, uh, but uh, Audrey and I made a trip back there we left in 1966. That's when the House requested us to come back to Canada. Uh, but in uh, 
a few years after that, we made a trip back and spent another three or four weeks in Mafeking and in and about there and saw all our old friends. We were so glad to see them. And then this year, the, um, the house requested we go back. Uh, we had another trip. And we had a message from Lucretia uh, saying that she hoped Audrey and I would stay with her. She was living in the same house that she and the dairy had lived in for many years. And uh, uh, the very first day we arrived, after an absence of some 27 years since we had lived there, and Lucretia signed her card that day. And so she became a Baha'i. It took her a long time to get around to it. But, uh, oh, how happy everybody was. And we were there for the convention, the National Convention uh, of uh, Boputuswana, which is the new uh, African uh, country, really. And... uh, um, we were at the convention and uh, we had persuaded Lucretia to come and uh, she was sitting in the back and then uh, when I was called upon I told the story much of what I've just told you now and then I ended up by saying that Lucretia had signed her card three days before that well they were so excited and so thrilled to realize that finally Lucretia was a Baha'i. They clapped and they stamped their feet and they only gave her a tumultuous welcome. So she came forward to the platform and she was so happy to have this wonderful reception. And they clapped and stamped their feet and they had a wonderful time. And so that, that is the story of the Malemus although there were there are other Malemas and many other friends of Madiris and relations who came into the bay. But friends, that will give you uh, one picture of what the, the chosen angels can do. And we must never feel that the chosen angels will let us down. We know that they are there, always. And we can count on them. And when we reach a time of a crisis, such as we seem to be in now, we must realize that uh, the crisis is not really a crisis. Because so long as they are there, and we are receiving this help, and we can always have it, You know the wording, the unseen divine assistance encompasses those who deliver the message. If the work of delivering the message be neglected, the assistance is entirely cut off. For it is impossible that the friends of God could receive assistance unless they be engaged in delivering the message. I remember one time when I was in Africa, the, uh, the beloved guardian asked me to come back to Canada on a trip and visit my old friends and see what I could do to help them to get started in really teaching the faith. Uh, But this one night in one place, on a Friday night, uh, I was making my talk on that subject and saying that everywhere, everywhere, there are people waiting, wanting to come into the faith. And not to have the feeling that nobody wanted to come in. And that there are people prepared, ready to come. And at that meeting, a young man stood up and he said, John, what you say may be true. It may be that there are people waiting to come into the faith everywhere. But he said, it isn't true where I live. 
Well, I said, where do you live? Well, he said, my wife and I live about 20 miles from here in a little town. And we have a store. And he said, you know, we've been there for five years. And we have a beautiful picture of Abra Baha. And we have a picture of the temple. And we have a pile of pamphlets, Baha'i pamphlets, which we want to give to people. But he says, nobody looks at those pictures. Nobody takes the pamphlet. And he said, you know why they don't? And I said, no, why? He said, they're all dead. They're dead. They're spiritually dead. It isn't true that every place there are people waiting to come into the faith. Because there's nobody in that town. This was a Friday night. And after I listened to this, getting a little redder in the neck as he spoke, I said, look, my friend, what you say really is not true. There are people there. And if you and your wife would go home and say these prayers tonight, which is Friday, and tomorrow night and Sunday night, I said, on Monday morning, Somebody will come in and ask you about the Baha'i thing. And then I wonder why ever I had said that. <laughs> I thought I'm getting crazy as I get older. I wasn't nearly as old then. But anyway, uh, I said, somebody will come in to see you on Monday morning and they will want to know about the Baha'i faith. So, I had a letter from him several days later and he said, you'll never guess what happened. He said, my wife and I went home and we prayed those prayers Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. We opened the store a little earlier than we ever opened it. And we closed it a little later than we ever closed it. And nobody came to ask about the faith. But he said, we went home that evening and we talked about it. And we decided that if we were, if we were going to be lights in this town, we just must tune in to the source of power. And we would pray again tonight, Monday night. And so we did. We prayed more than we had prayed the other three nights all put together. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And he said on Tuesday morning, a man came in. And he walked over to those pictures of Abdu'l-Bahá in the temple and he said, would you come over and tell me something about this? And he said, I went over and he said, I'd like to know something about the Baha'i faith. <laughs> so he said, could I and my wife come and spend an evening with you and your wife and talk about this? And he said, yes, you certainly could. Let's make, can you make it tomorrow night? So they agreed that Wednesday night, this couple would come to their house and they would talk about the faith. <laughs> and you know who that is? And he said they came and before they left that night, they'd signed two cards and they were behind. And there were some live people in that town. And within five months, they had an assembly in the town where everybody was dead. And I told him then, I said, you know, it's, it's, you just can't make such a statement that people are dead, that there are no Baha'is waiting to come into the faith. Because if you, if you do make such a statement, you're accusing God of being uneconomic. Why would God have two fine teachers like I judge you and your wife are? 
living in a place where everybody was dead. I said, the very fact you're there is a proof that there are other people who must be alive too. And you know, funny thing about that story is that my wife, when I told her about it, I came back to Africa again and told her. And of course, she always believes what I tell her. She's not here now. But that is one story she really didn't ever quite believe. I told her all about this, you know, how this happened and these people did come and so on. But one time after we were back in Canada, uh, we went to a meeting not far from our house and we went out and lo and behold, here were, the, were these two people who had signed up on that Wednesday night. <laughs> And I'd, I'd gotten to know them by this time. And so with my wife sitting there, I told the story about how they had come into the faith. And I told the story just exactly as it was, as I always do. And then I introduced my wife to this couple. And I said, I just wanted you to confirm that what I said it was right. And they said, absolutely. And I said, there was no embroidering of that story at all. And there wasn't. But friends, it, I have seen it happen again and again and again and again. That there are people waiting now, right now, everywhere, to come into the faith. This is the only place there is that is within the cause of Baha'u'llah, where there's any hope for mankind. It is the one place. And friends, we have got to do something about it. We have to find these people. And we don't have to look very far. We must remember that the chosen angels are working all the time. And I could sit here and tell you stories like this uh, for a long time. But there are people like this just waiting to come in. One time, oh, quite a few years ago, um, I was at a, a luncheon and I was, I was with the London Life. And our management put on a manager's luncheon. And it happened to fall on the first day of the fast. <laughs> and I called the, my chief. I said, look, couldn't you make it a day early? That's not a good day for me. That's a day of the fast and I can't eat. And if the company are going to pay for the lunch, I would like to have a good lunch <laughs> and not sit there and have you pay for a great big lunch that I don't eat any of. But it is too late. So we had the lunch, and here there were six of us, six, five managers, and this, this chap from head office. We were sitting around having a lovely lunch together, accepting that I wasn't eating. And... Uh, the chap sitting beside me, he said, why aren't you eating? Well, I said, I'm on a fast. <laughs> and he said, is it something to do with your, uh, your weight? I said, no, no, not my weight. He said, have you been overdoing it a little bit lately? And I said, no, no, it's just a, it's just a kind of a, a religious fast. Well, he said, that's interesting. What, what, what kind of a fast is it? Well, these other fellows were telling the usual stories that these life insurance people tell when they get together. And I didn't think those stories would go very well with my talk on the Baha'i fast. However, I told it. And this one fellow, to my surprise, sitting beside me, he said, tell me, what kind of a fast, what kind of a religion is it? 
Well, I said, it's the Baha'i faith. Oh, I never heard of that. Well, what is it? Tell me about it. Well, I knew these other fellows wouldn't be a bit interested in a talk on the Baha'i faith. What's more, I was a little timid in those days, and I didn't really like to start giving a, a talk on the Baha'i fast while they were all having a good time eating a great enormous steak paid for by the company. <laughs> And I knew they wouldn't be a bit interested. But this one bird, he was very much interested. And before the before we finished our lunch, he said, say, can I be a Baha'i? <laughs> this just shows you, no matter where you go, you find them everywhere. And uh, I said, you maybe want to take a little look at it first. Well, he said, when can I do that? So he drove me home, and he, uh, he borrowed a book. And he really wasn't very satisfied with that. He thought he'd like to have two or three books. But I told him one was enough. And uh, for, to start with, and when he said, can we have lunch together tomorrow when we talk some more? So we had lunch the next day. And uh, by this time, I'd brought him another book. And he said, you know, um, my wife and I would like to, uh, be, like to become the Baha'is. Would that be all right? Well, I said, you'd better look into this a little more than that. Uh, I said, this is just a little too fast. We aren't, we aren't accustomed to bringing people in like that. And, uh, well, he said, uh, what can we do then? Because he said, to me, I've been studying this very kind of a thing. He said, when I went to, to university uh, a few years ago, I was told that this was what the world needed, a religion just like that. In fact, my professor at the, at, at, at the university, he described this very religion. He didn't know about that religion. He'd never heard of the Baha'i faith, but he knew what the, what the needs were. And this is it. And I'd like to join. Well, I said, I'll tell you what you do. You'd better talk it over with your wife. It's a good thing for you both to come in together, not just one. Oh, shucks, she said. I'd like to come in now. <laughs> you know, friends, you don't always get them that eager. But, but there are people like that everywhere you go. And you know, that fellow... Uh, I said, look, we have a summer school down at Rice Lake, and you come and you bring your wife. And so they came, and they both were very anxious to be Baha'is right off the bat. And so it wasn't long after that that they both signed their cards, they both met with the assembly, they both became Baha'is, and friends, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I wouldn't tell you who they are, who these people are, but they're probably the best Baha'is you ever saw. And that was back in 1945. And I'm not going to tell you who they are because some of you might know them. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to embarrass them. But that's, that's a pretty good story, don't you think? <laughs> The teachings of Baha'u'llah happen to be the only thing we've got. It's the only hope for mankind. There is no other hope, absolutely none. Nothing. Take a look at the world today. It's sinking. Read a newspaper. Listen to the, the newscast. Every day, any day. And what do you find? Wars. Hatred. Imprisonments. Fires. Floods, trouble of every kind. Prices going up, costs of everything going up, values coming down. And friends, you wonder where are we going? What's happening to us? Well, the thing is, friends, God has sent a messenger to this, this earth. God has sent a messenger to this earth with laws. 
And he expects the people to look at those laws and obey them. He expects us to, to rise and say, Dear God, thank you for letting me in on this great secret. We have got the Baha'i faith. We know about it. But what are we doing with it? And when we get into the next world, what's going to happen? Then we're going to see all these people who haven't done a thing about it. Friends, I don't really mean to do Thank you, discouraged. Um, now, how to close the deal and invite people to grow in the faith. That's another one, friends. Uh, I've told you some of those things. How to enroll. How to close the deal. Well, um, one way I think is, is a very good way is um, the way we did it was the Sydney Price or to just ask them to they want to be a Baha'i, they love Baha'u'llah, and, and ask them to sign and have a card. But don't press the card at anybody. Don't ever press. But I think you can just tell people what it is, what the Baha'i faith is, and how important it is, and how it's the one hope for mankind, and how to use a teaching book. Well, I told you about that. Uh, have that book and just show it to people if you wish. Uh, it's a wonderful book and uh, they, they like it. And how to use prayer to assist one's efforts. Well, friends, that is a, that is a subject that could go on forever. Uh, there's one, one way that this, I think is very, very important is uh, to pray, say prayers. And I wanted to tell you about the long obligatory prayer. But any prayer, you know, you know the story about the remover of difficulties 500 times? Uh, or do you? You know how Baha'u'llah in God passes by page 119 and about halfway through? Baha'u'llah says to people, bid them to recite. Is there any remover of difficulties? Say, be God, he is God. All are his servants and all abide by his bidding. Well, uh, and if you say that uh, and tell them to, to recite it 500 times, nay, a thousand times, by day and by night, sleeping and waking. So that, uh, and there are many people, why in our, my house in Rotten, where we live, we've had people there every Monday night for a year, a year next week, saying the remover of difficulties 500 times. Sometimes there have been eight or nine people, sometimes only two, three or four or five. And they come, they come at 7 o'clock, and we start saying the prayers at 7. And one person counts with the beads, and we go through 100, and then he says 100, we go through to 200, and he says 200, right through, then 500. It takes one hour and 40 minutes to say that 150 uh, words. No, 500 words. It takes 140 minutes. And uh, many people say that prayer. Um, and if you don't do it, you should try it. Say it. If you, if you get to the point where you don't sleep very well at night or if you just can't sleep at all at night, say that prayer quietly. Just turn to God and say, is there any remover of difficulties? Say God. Say, praise be God. He is God. All are his servants and all abide by his bidding. I've got a string of beads here. Perhaps you can't see them. But there are 100 beads, little tiny beads. And I have that on my fingers. And I go through. And I, I do that. Go once through. That's, that's a 100 times. 
and that takes me 20 minutes. And keep on doing it 500 times. And uh, you know that you are speaking to God. And it's a very comforting thought as you say, knowing that there is only one remover of difficulties, and that's God. Is there any remover of difficulties? Say God. Say praise be God. He is God. All are his servants and all abide by his bidding. And just go through this, these beads and do one and then do another one and keep on going until you've done a hundred and then keep on going until you've done five hundred. And that generate the way we do it. It takes one hour and forty minutes. And you feel close to God when you've done that. You feel as though you belong. And friends, this is what we do. And then when we get to the point where we, we think of these negative qualities that uh, bug us, things we do we know we shouldn't do. Nobody needs to tell us we do these things. But we do them and we want to get over them, and we think of the, of the way of overcoming these things that I read out this morning to you, how we, how we do it. We do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. We, thank you, we, we, we turn to that power of the Holy Spirit, and we think about that, and we say, is there any remover of difficulties save God? We know there is no other remover of difficulties. There is only one, God. Say praise be God. He is God. All are his servants and all abide by his bidding. Friends, this is it. That is Baha'u'llah. He didn't say we had to do it. It's not the part of the teachings that we should do it. But it's there for us to do if we want to do it. And there are many, many people who do it every day. Lots of people do it every day. And they have these beads. And other but other people, now my wife doesn't use beads. She prays, she numbers them off on her fingers. She knows when she's done 100, she knows when she's done 500. Then other people have different methods. methods. I sometimes do them. If I haven't got my beads, I do it by the clock. And I know if I do it in, in, in 20 minutes, I've done 100. And I tick, 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 and I say the beads to the ticks of the clock. But friends, this is one way. And there are many ways. But this is the way we remember. And we should love God. We should spend our life. And you know that, that hidden word? Love me. But what God says to us, love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Know this, O servant. We must love God or he doesn't love us. You know why? I'm sure you do. Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Know this, O servant. If you take a little plant, a little shrub, a little plant, put it outside in the, in the sunshine and leave it there. The sun will come out and, and warm it and it'll grow into a, into a lovely plant, grow into a big tree. But if we don't, it'll die because it hasn't got the love of God on it. And so if we want to have that love ourselves, if we want the love of God, we must love Him. Uh, but I will say, allow a And thank you for being such a wonderful audience.